watching online worship. Be pleased to the book of Malachi. I'll read just a few verses and remember as I'm reading these verses that this is coming at the end of about a thousand year period of revelation that God has given to his people. If you take the Exodus around the mid 1400s before Christ and the book of Malachi around 400 before Christ, you've got a millennium that has gone by and this is the last prophetic voice inscribed in Holy Writ. After that is going to follow this so-called hiatus of the intertestamental period and the next voice that would be heard four centuries later would be that of John the Baptist who was preparing the way of the Lord. So this particular book is bringing about a thousand years of revelational history between God and his people. And it is fascinating to see how God speaks in this book. Bear in mind that on the historical backdrop, most people are almost wondering where God is. Nothing extraordinary threatens, nothing extraordinary seems to be prospering them. There's almost a middle ground, a kind of eerie silence, nothing dramatic is happening. And yet, if you look at this book, in 55 verses, God is referred to either in the first person or the third person in 53 of those 55 verses. And it's a dialogical fashion here. I say this and you say that. I say this and you say that. It's God interacting with his people. Follow me as I earmark several verses. We'll be leaping over many of them to help tie together this big picture of worship. Verse 1, chapter 1. The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, says the Lord, yet you say, in what way have you loved us? We stop right there. I have loved you, says the Lord, yet you say, in what way have you loved us? Look at verse 6. A son honors his father and a servant his master. If then I am the father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my reverence, says the Lord of hosts? To you priests who despise my name, yet you say, in what way have we despised your name? You offer defiled food on my altar, but say, in what way have we defiled you? By saying, the table of the Lord is contemptible. And when you offer the blind as a sacrifice, is it not evil? And when you offer the lame and the sick, is it not evil? Offer it then to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you favorably, says the Lord of hosts. Verse 10. Who is there even among you who would shut the doors so that you would not kindle fire on my altar in vain? I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, nor will I accept an offering from your hands. For from the rising of the sun, even to its going down, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. In every place, incense shall be offered to my name and a pure offering. For my name shall be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. But you profane it in that you say the table of the Lord is defiled and its food is contemptible. You also say, oh, what a weariness, and you sneer at it, says the Lord of hosts, and you bring the stolen, the lame, and the sick. Thus you bring an offering, should I accept this from your hand, says the Lord. What an opening message for a closing book. I say this and you say that. I say this and you say that. And I think one of the most unimaginable things that had happened is in those closing verses I just read to you where God says, you've also said what a weariness this whole thing is. You've sort of sniffed at the whole thing. God had actually become a boring entity to the people after a thousand years had gone by. That's what they'd said. This whole thing has become wearisome to us. How ironic and that's the end result when worship has lost its worth. Let me juxtapose for you two thoughts side by side before I proceed with the answers. One I read to you last night, so I wanted to refresh your memory from D.H. Lawrence. 
We want to delude ourselves that the problem of our emptiness, love, is at the root. I want to say to you, it isn't. Love is only the branches. The root goes beyond love, a naked kind of isolation, an isolated me that does not meet and mingle and never can. It is true what I say. There is a beyond in you and a beyond in me which goes further than love, beyond the scope of stars, just as some stars are beyond the scope of our vision. So our own search goes beyond the scope of love. At least I think that it is at the root going beyond love itself. Love may be a certain kind of an answer for our isolation, but it is not the consummate answer. Something has to go beyond love. Now, the next thing I'm going to read for you here is, is not easy to understand. And if you lose some of its intricacy along the way, don't, don't be disturbed by it because it is rather uh, difficultly worded. And it comes at the last page of what I think is one of the finest books I have ever read. It's uh, written by G.K. Chesterton, and it's called Orthodoxy. It is an extraordinary volume. Many of you may not realize that it was Chesterton's writings that became the last link in the conversion of C.S. Lewis himself. I'm referring to Chesterton's book, Everlasting Man. But in his book, Orthodoxy, just before he brings some marvelous thoughts to an end, particularly as he talks about the wonder that God has fused into this world and can fuse into our hearts, he raises this very fascinating question. Why do we never read in the scriptures, Jesus laughed? We hear of him weeping. We hear of him upset. We hear of him sort of rebuking people. And he says, I wish somewhere it were written. And Jesus laughed. Certainly, there must be some sense of joy and mirth in the mind of God himself. But you see, as he begins to answer this, he works through an argument saying this, follow me please. He points out how joy is central to the Christian's life and sorrow is peripheral. Joy is central and sorrow is peripheral. The reason is that the fundamental questions of life are answered and only the peripheral ones are not answered. For the unbeliever, sorrow is central and joy is peripheral because the fundamental questions of life for the skeptic are still unanswered, only the peripheral ones for the skeptic may be answered. But listen to how he words it. Listen carefully. Joy which was the small publicity of the pagan, is the gigantic secret of the Christian. And as I close this chaotic volume, I open again the strange small book from which all Christianity came. And I'm again haunted by a kind of confirmation. This tremendous figure, which fills the Gospels, towers in this respect as in every other above all the thinkers who ever thought themselves tall. His pathos was natural, almost casual. The Stoics, ancient and modern, were proud of concealing their tears. He never concealed his tears. He showed them plainly on his open face at any daily sight, such as the far sight of his native city. Yet he concealed something. Solemn supermen and imperial diplomatists are proud of restraining their anger. He did not restrain his anger. He flung furniture down the front steps of the temple and asked men how they expected to escape the damnation of hell. Yet he restrained something. I say it with reverence. There was in that shattering personality a thread that must be called shyness. There was something that he hid from all men when he went up to a mountain alone to pray. There was something that he covered constantly by abrupt silence or impetuous isolation. There was some one thing that was too great for God to show us when he walked upon our earth. And I have sometimes fancied that it was his mirth. The laughter of God. And he says, I fancy 
that someday when we are in his presence, it will all be opened up in a way for which there was no earthly analogy to do justice to. And I believe worship is that clue that takes us into that mirth of God. Let me begin to unravel this for you. And obviously we have limited time and limited ideas. I can't go into this in any hint of comprehensiveness, but maybe I can touch the nerve of this so that you and I can understand what it is that God really is seeking to accomplish when he calls us to worship him. The first thing he says to them as he opens this book is, I have loved you, yet you say, in what way have you loved us? I have loved you. It's that perfect tense, present implications, past action. I have loved you, yet you say, in what way have you loved us? Go back across the centuries. We could go back to the time of Abraham, when with the grandeur of his grace, he called this man, and through his loins, he said, every nation of this earth will be blessed. Took him, though undeserving in himself, to make him a blessing to the world. We could go as far back as we could think of, But let us go back just about four centuries because one of the most bluntly worded books of the Old Testament is given to us. I'm referring to the book of Hosea that was spent around the late 700s before Christ. Hosea was one of the most unusual prophets whose privilege it was to minister to the northern kingdom of Israel. But what was so unusual about him, he was commanded by God to go and marry a woman whose name was Gomer and she was going to become a prostitute. So God took this holy man, commanded him to go and love Gomer, knowing that she would be a harlot and betray her trust to him. Out of that marriage were born three children. The first was called Jezreel, meaning judgment. The second was called Luami, meaning not my people. The third was called Loruhama, meaning no more mercy. Can you imagine living in that household? Judgment, no more mercy, not my people. Judgment, come for breakfast, no more mercy, clean up your room. Not my people, when are you going to go to school? The whole home spelled the brokenness. I want you to imagine this scene with me. She had sold herself into harlotry. Can you picture this, for example? Hosea is getting ready to deliver his message to the people. And his children are living by having been abandoned by the mother while she has sold herself on the streets of town. Think of some men walking past the brothel and finding the opportunity to go into the brothel and buy the prophet's wife for a few uh, moments of pleasure. Think then members of his congregation who are walking past the brothel on the way to go and listen to Hosea and some taunting, sensuous individual calls out and says, would you go and tell your prophet today that we've had the pleasure of buying his wife for some moments a few days ago. We've enjoyed it. We are back again. Go and say that to him, will you? Taunting the people. I can imagine finally some of his own congregation taking him aside and saying, Hosea, we love you dearly. We respect you. We believe you're a godly man. But can you answer one thorny question to us? How can a holy man of God like you have ever been joined to a harlotrous woman like that? And Hosea probably said, I've been waiting for you to ask the question because I will answer yours after you will answer mine. How can a holy God like that love such a harlot? people like us. God's love is completely unmerited. God's love completely undeserving. And as I look at this message 800 years before Malachi, I say to myself, he loved them. He showed it in such graphic terms. Why didn't they understand it? About 200 years after Hosea came a man by the name of Ezekiel. He wasn't speaking to the northern kingdom. He was speaking to the southern kingdom of Judah. And he spoke in this parable, the word of God speaking in the first person this way. I walked through the highways of this land one day and I heard a baby crying. I went into the bushes from where the crying came and I saw this newly born baby in the bushes, still so newly born that the afterbirth still marred its body. 
its umbilical cord was only freshly severed. I took the baby to the waters nearby and I washed its body, sprinkled it with perfume, covered it with soft pieces of cloth, and I left it with careful, compassionate care. Many, many years went by. I spied a splendidly attractive young woman. I loved her, offered her my hand in marriage. She agreed to be wedded to me. Oh, Israel, you were the little baby I rescued as I walked along the highway. You were the young woman years later who had grown up from being that little one. I loved you, desired you, and committed myself to you. Now, after years of being wedded to you, Israel, all of these in metaphorical usages, of course, he says, after the years of being wedded to you, I wish I could call you a harlot. But you know what? A harlot at least defends herself by saying she is paid with her, by her lovers to lie with them. Israel, you become worse than that. You're paying your lovers to lie with you. 800, harlotry was the biggest charge. 586, harlotry would have been flattering. 400 BC, he says, I have loved you. And they say, in what way? You know, ladies and gentlemen, somewhere in the world of philosophy, we made a huge blunder across the centuries when we lost contact with the reality of our emotions and made human beings purely cerebral. And then in the 1950s and the 60s, the existentialist philosophers became so popular, focusing on emotion, focusing on passion, focusing on experience, and swung the pendulum to the other degree where rationality was not as important as much as acting with passion for the moment became that important. Somewhere in the middle is the balance. God has given us our emotions for a reason. Just as he has given us sensitivities to touch, when you put your hand on something that burns, you pull it away. And the reason you pull it away is you know if you keep it there, it'll burn the rest of your body. Emotions are supposed to be indicators of reality, not fabricators or framers of reality. Let me underscore this, because this is such a vital part of worship. C.S. Lewis, in his book, The Abolition of Man, has as his opening chapter a strange title, Men Without Chests. Now, that's a strange title. He's not talking about us fellows who are not bodybuilders, but he's got something better in mind. You know, Lewis never liked to criticize anybody, and Lewis never liked to respond to criticism. On this one occasion, he made one slender response and backed away. What was he responding to? There was a couple of writers that Lewis did not even name by their actual name. He said, let me call them Gaius and Titius, but that's not their real name. He said, they've written a book. I won't name the book. I'll call it the Green Book. They were taking issue with Lewis's teaching of children about moral theory, that children have the capacity to be taught in moral theory. And these two, Gaius and Titius, were sort of attacking that notion. And Lewis is now mildly responding to them. And this is what he basically says. He says, Gaius and Titius are trying to tell us that moral reality and our emotions have no connection. They say something like this. They take an incident from Samuel Taylor Coleridge's life, the romantic poet, who made a comment once about two young people walking past a waterfall. And both of them commented on the waterfall. One of them said, my, isn't it sublime? And the other said, my, isn't it pretty? And Coleridge said the young man who said it was sublime was right on target. But now Gaius and Titius come around and say, there's no such thing as a sublime waterfall. It was pretty, was more accurate, because they say, when your glands respond to beauty, or when your glands respond to ideas that you call good and bad, it's not because good and bad actually exist out there, it's only because our cultural conditioning provokes a glandular, a visceral response, such that, for example, if you pick up a child on the side of the road that's been hurt, and you pick that child up, certain glands 
then start secreting juices which tell you what you have done is a good thing. You haven't actually done a good thing. It's just a glandular response. Or if you'd taken the child that was hurt and actually suffocated it to death, you didn't actually do something bad. A different set of glands secreted a different set of juices that told you you'd actually done something bad while there was no such thing as good or bad out there. Just in case you think that's outlandish, by the way, just watch moral education in our time. Watch what teachers are instructing students about in terms of moral right and moral wrong at their youngest age. I have been on campuses and I could tell you stories that will leave you absolutely aghast as to how they're instructing young people in moral theory. That it is actually purely a cultural construct. It is a glandular response, nothing more. C.S. Lewis says these men are conveying dangerous ideas because these men imply to me that mathematics is real, therefore my brain is real. Food is real, therefore my stomach is real. But right and wrong don't actually exist. Therefore, my emotional response to those things is purely a cultural thing. He said, if these men are believed in what they are saying, they'll produce a generation of men with heads, men with stomachs, men with no heart, men without chests. No emotion. Emotion is so real. And what God is saying here is, I have loved you. And the people look at him and say, in what way? Can you imagine if that was relevant before the cross, how much more would that be relevant after the cross? My conclusion on that first thought is that you cannot worship without emotion. I didn't say emotionalism. I said emotion. Because there is that bond of love. There is that relationship of love. And why, when the music is sung, when the hymns are sung and the choruses are sung, do we get stirred within us? Is because the voice is giving vent not just to an idea, but to an emotion. I have loved you. I hope you don't look at him tonight and say, in what way? You cannot worship him without emotion. I have loved you, God said. How clearly this is seen in our day in the light of the cross. The Father sent his own Son to die for us. Let's not be like the people of Malachi's day who question God's love. The cross has settled that once and for all. As Ravi said, we cannot truly worship without true emotion, true love for God. In light of what God has done for us out of his heart, let's return to him the love of our hearts 